The following video is a deep, nerdy look at one of my all-time favorite books, the Commodore 64 Programmer's Reference Guide. This video was originally recorded October 2019 as an exclusive for my patrons on Patreon.com. After consulting with my patrons, I'll be releasing some of these videos publicly. Thanks to each of them for their support. Hi, it's Robin. This is a patron-exclusive video. This is my first one. So, for this first episode, I thought I would talk about my three favorite C64 books. But as it turns out, I've got so much to say just about the this ch top choice here, the C64 Programmer's Reference Guide, that I will have to get to those other books later. But just in case you're curious, one is Mapping the Commodore 64, and the other is this Programming the Commodore 64, the Definitive Guide by Rato Colin West. So these are also excellent books. But today we're going to be going with this absolute classic from 1982, I believe, the Programmer's Reference Guide. If I was only going to recommend one book to somebody, it still would be this one, because it's still relatively easy and inexpensive to get a real copy of. It's very easy to find digitally online. There's either PDF versions or text versions. I'm just going to be going through some things I find interesting about this book. And one of the first things is that on the cover is a silver badge C64. For many years, they kept this C64 on the cover of this book, uh, even though the Commodore 64 no longer had that label on it. And this book actually underwent very few revisions. I haven't made a comprehensive study of it largely remained unchanged right throughout the run and it also has pet style keyboard on the front too and that actually wasn't even on the original silver label 64s i believe i've got several copies of this i bought my very first one in 1984 uh, just after I, I got my c64 in march of 1984 and as soon as i could afford this book i believe it was about 30 dollars canadian I bought a copy. It's not this copy. Um, this one's amusing. I put a picture of this on Twitter, in case you didn't see that. There it is. Wayne, happy seventh anniversary. Love, Debbie. It's kind of Canadian tradition to write the day, month, and year like that. And this particular copy is the first edition, the 15th printing in 1985. So I'll just be going through the book, pointing out some things I find interesting. But just a couple of the most interesting things, I'll jump ahead here. Here on page 151, this is a section about the VIC, and it's describing about the interrupt enable register. Now, a lot of people think that things like sprite multiplexing perhaps weren't part of the vision of the original Commerce 64 designers, or that this was some strange, crazy stuff that was invented later. Well, right here in 1982, uh, this, talking about raster interrupts, this powerful interrupt structure lets you use split screen modes. For instance, you can have half of the screen bitmapped, half text, more than eight sprites at a time, etc. I think this was really a response to the display lists that the 8-bit the Ataris had at the time. That was touted as uh, being extremely powerful. Well, the C64 solution is using raster interrupts instead. And in some ways, it's a more flexible solution. Uh, not to take anything away from the Atari 8 bits. I found it interesting that that was sprite multiplexers were forecast right here in 1982. And the other one is on page 368. I noticed that there's a blank section here. I actually spent a long time searching this book, trying to find the section I'm talking about only to learn that they actually deleted it from some of these later printings. So it's the same edition, but here on page 368, blank, 369, 370, 371, and then here the appendices. So wait again. Well, what did they censor out of here? I'll show you. Here's an older edition of the book. Actually, it's not an older edition. I should say, this one's really beat up. This is just the ninth printing from 1984. And here you go. The Z80 microprocessor cartridge, page 368. See how the 
newer version of the book. <laughs> it's exactly the same. Commodore 64. And then blank. What's interesting about this section, the Z80 microprocessor cartridge, when the Super CPU first came out, that's this giant cartridge here from CMD, plugs into Commodore 64 and gives it a 20 megahertz 65816. Here's my well-worn machine here. So when this came out, a lot of purists online poo-pooed it, so to speak saying that's not a real Commodore 64 or, or whatever. That's, that's not how it's supposed to be. And that's, that's fine. I'm not going to make anybody like a super CPU, but I just want to point out that in 1982, of all things, Commodore wanted you to <laughs> thought it would be a great thing to have a CPM cartridge, which has a Z80 microprocessor in it. So the Commodore CPM cartridge eliminates this hassle because our Z80 cartridge plugs into the back of your Commodore 64 quickly and easily without any messy wires that can cause problems later. So I just found I'm using what do the purists think about the 1982 Commodore 64 having a Z80 cartridge plugged in. Like 65816, that's a lot, a lot more Commodore 64 friendly having the successor, so to speak, to the 6502, 6510 processor seems a lot more in the spirit of Commodore than having a Z80 like this. Anyway, that, that cartridge was a real technical disaster, and I believe that's why it got pulled uh, from the book. They, they wanted to try and erase it from history. Another interesting little detail here is on page 121, where out of nowhere it talks about the VSP cartridge is also available to add high resolution commands. Now this VSP cartridge, this is the only time it's mentioned in the entire book as far as I can tell. And apparently it stands for video support package. It may exist in prototype form, but as far as I know, it was never actually released. Or it may have become the Super Expander 64 and also the same kind of functions were in Simon's Basic. But then right after that is a very funny typo. To add high resolution commands to Commodorf 64 Basic. <laughs> this Commodorf typo was pointed out to me by John Cook on Twitter. So thanks to him for that. And as far as we can tell, this only exists in the first printing from 1982 and was corrected in the later ones. It's interesting how these various changes are still considered the same edition. And uh, I, I don't know how common that is on multiple printings to still make small changes like this. So if we look here in my ninth printing on page 121, it still mentions the VSP cartridge, but Commodorf is gone, and instead we have the Commodore 64 basic. One other curious thing here on page 460 in the SID, there are 29 8 bit registers in SID which control the generation of sound. These registers are either write only or read only. Uh, even, even myself, I have forgotten that at times I'd be trying to peek a register on the SID. Uh, I actually don't remember what value you get back, but you don't get the right one. So the registers on the SID, they are either write or read only, depending on the register. Uh, they are not both. And more or less every other register on the C64, everyone that I can think of, is both read and write. Uh, although some of them give a different result, like the raster register. If you read it, you get the current raster interrupt. But if you write, you're telling it where you want the next interrupt to occur. Right, just a curious thing. Oh, and one other goofy story about the C64, the programmer's reference guide. I had this in 1984 when I started university in 19, was it 90, 91? I actually was even bringing this book to university because I was still so fascinated with the C64. I had it out on the table during lunch reading it, and my friend Jeff had Yop. Do you remember that? It's a liquid yogurt drink. And somehow he spilled that all over my programmer's reference guide, and I did not react well. That was, I guess, my favorite book at the time. Well, still sort of is. Sorry, Jeff. Uh, we're still friends, I think. 
All right, back to the beginning here, or near the beginning. How to crunch basic programs. You can pack more instructions and power into your basic programs by making each program as short as possible. This process of shortening programs is called crunching. And <laughs> I get scolded online uh, in the comments for some of my videos. My friend Jason frequently is getting after me for not putting spaces in lines, for putting so many instructions. I'm trying to break that habit, but you can see that from the age of 11, when I first bought this, uh, this this was right here, and I, I absolutely <laughs> followed Commodore's advice here about shortening the line numbers, putting multiple instructions on each line, removing statements, abbreviating keywords. Actually, it's funny that they talk about uh, abbreviating lines actually doesn't save any memory, but it does allow you to pack more than 80 characters onto a line. So, and they give a lot of good advice here, actually, as far as optimizing, eliminating spaces. <laughs> there it is. So, see, I was indoctrinated at a young age. Jump into the back of the book. How many programming books would include a schematic of the entire computer? Copyright 1982. Uh, I'm not going to be able to get it all on camera, but there we go. Hooking up the RAM. The ROM and on the inside, CPU, CIA chips, two of them. Did I miss the VIC? Where's that must be on this side. There's SID, VIC, and there's the color ROM. Actually, why'd they call it color ROM? From D800, it should be a color RAM. Weird. Nibbles, and you can see how that color RAM is directly connected to the VIC. Anyway, this schematic is not perfect, it's not exact, but it's it's still a good reference. And a nice bonus. My original one I actually hung on my wall. Wonder how many teenagers had pictures of their computer circuit <laughs> on the wall instead of women in bikinis or whatever. Now talk about one of the bad, probably the worst thing about this book. On page 210, this basic to machine language section. This is a very unevenly written chapter because it's very, I don't know, it's starting off at very simple levels, like at a very simple level. Uh, trying to explain to the absolute beginner, it seems to me, and then it talks about what does machine code look like, simple memory map, this is all fine, but then you'd think that the next step, okay, the registers inside the microprocessor, the accumulator, this is the most important register in the microprocessor, and the X is meanwhile a very important register. The Y register is very important. <laughs> but here's the status register. It consists of eight flags, a flag, but it gives no description. This is where the zero flag, zero flag, negative. This is absolutely critical to actually programming assembly language, and they aren't, they're not even named, never mind described. This is a real, really big oversight. It's sort of like this was an early draft, and then they just threw it in here. And it's right into how do you write machine language programs. It talks about 64 mon. Hexadecimal. Then gets into description of binary. This It's all fine, but it just jumps over details horribly. Uh, suddenly it's teaching you a tiny little bit about the monitor. But then that's it. Like Then it's describing load A... And then from basic to assembly, but it, yeah. Addressing modes. And as a kid, I remember trying to enter this and I had no idea that I needed a machine language monitor. Wasn't supplied and uh, I certainly didn't want to go buy something, but I don't think I was even aware. I, I obviously wasn't reading this carefully enough. I remember trying to enter this into basic and it didn't work. It wasn't until a few years later, somebody gave me a copy of uh, Jim Butterfield's Supermon, and then this this opened up. 
And that really changed my game development. Suddenly, the, the very poor instructions here were at least somewhat usable. Useful tips for the beginner. Don't <laughs> get another, get another book. So as far as tutorial, that's something I haven't said yet. This book is excellent as a reference guide. If you actually want to learn from scratch, this is not the book to use. Um, something like Jim Butterfield's, one of Jim Butterfield's books is the way to go. Even this approaching a large task, it's talking about how to make a roulette game in machine language. <laughs> and it does like kind of, it's not like a flow chart, but like a pseudocode for it. That's, that's cool and all, but it, suddenly it just wraps up. Like this is the main outline. You can break it down further. Um, this process only improves the practice. So keep trying. Well, I guess I did take that advice to heart because I kept at it for, well, I'm still keeping at it. Eh? This is where this book is pretty useful. That's an okay overview, but this is where I still go when I have a question about what opcodes are available, which addressing modes are available, what flags do they affect, how many bytes do they use, how many cycles, well, how many bytes is pretty obvious, but how many cycles is useful. And I find this book very easy to find. This is exactly enough information, and I can find it very quickly. Now, if you only had this book, Programming the Commerce 64, you would be just fine, but isn't as quick, at least I don't find as quick, to find the information that, that I need when I'm just in the middle of solving a problem and trying to figure out how to best implement it. Another section that was huge for me was this about programmable characters, explaining here First of all, how to tell the C64, tell the VIC chip, how to start displaying programmable characters, how to reserve memory. There's a lot of very useful information packed in these few pages, starting at page 108. Yeah, how to reserve memory for graphics. And this program here that shows you how to disable, uh, yeah, not only reserve memory, turn off interrupts from BASIC, how to switch in the character ROM, copy it out, and then copy it in from ROM into RAM so you can then modify it. This really opened up game development to me. Once I knew how to make my own fonts and how to make custom characters to have walls or bullets or little, uh, little men to move around the screen, that was extremely addictive being able to change the graphics like that with just a few, like with eight pokes and you would have a new character to move around. That was very exciting. And it was laid out extremely well in here. I've heard that the Atari 8-bit computers, Atari was very poor at getting information out to programmers. And I don't know if they were trying to make people sign NDAs or they just wanted to keep the information to themselves. But I think ultimately that really hurt them Commodore came right out the gate with the Commodore 64, providing programmers with excellent documentation. I think that was a, another big part of why the Commodore 64 did so well, just dominating uh, game development. By the time 1984 and 1985 came around, the Commodore 64 was the leading game platform. Again, uh, I like the Atari 8-bits plenty, and I have several of them. It's just an observation that this book really was overall excellent. Another huge thing is this Commodore 64 memory map. This is packed full of useful information. Now, if you need more detail, then that's where a book like Mapping the Commodore 64 really comes in. But short of that, this was still excellent. You know what? I think this might have been my very first C64 Programmer's Reference Guide, because I'm seeing my printing in here. All these descriptions. Huh. Outrun. Sys8072. Was I hacking it? Yeah, EA31. Yeah, this is almost for sure. My, I, I wasn't sure when I grabbed this one. I know it's quite beat up. But I see a lot of my old notes and... <laughs> 
whatever spilling was going on there. Yuck. Was I bleeding or what? There's a real wealth of information about the about the hardware here. For example, this excellent description of the expansion port. I like call they have to warn you caution is necessary when using the expansion bus because it's possible to damage the Commodore 64 by a malfunction of your equipment. Oh, and we're already on this page, but for example, explain the dot clock. This is the 8.18 megahertz video dot clock. All system timing is derived from this clock. The dot clock, each pixel might know that the Commodore 64 runs at about one megahertz. Now this is actually describing the NTSC machine. You divide that by eight and you get the 1.02 megahertz that the processor works at. Well, actually the dot clock is driving everything. It's eight times faster than the CPU and the CPU, every clock cycle on the CPU, eight pixels are drawn by the VIC chip. So that's why it's multiplied by eight. It's actually the VIC drawing one pixel every clock and every eighth of those, the 6510 takes a, a turn. So it's interesting that's that how the video display and the CPU are clocked together there. Bus available about, this is where the VIC taking over the system bus. This whole idea of bad lines is referred to here. This line will go low three cycles before the VIC-2 takes over the system buses and remains low until the VIC-2 is finished fetching display information. That's a bad line right there. And here, DMA access. This is how the expansion port can completely take over the system bus and that is what makes things like the super CPU possible. The appendices are full of interesting information. Uh, I love this section about how to convert from one type of basic to another matrices functions, some basics use a backslash. So this was just kind of eye-opening. It's not particularly exciting, I guess, but I remember thinking about what are all these other basics? I only knew this one. These error messages, I did, my very first episode of 8-Bit Show and Tell was me going through all these error messages, and there are several that are left out of this list. So I'll, I'll put a link to that below. If you haven't seen some of my early episodes, <laughs> Maybe they could have used a bit more editing, but uh, for example, this bad data, that's actually a holdover from the Commodore PET. And on the C64, it's called file data error. So this bad data is like a, not a misprint, but it's, it's from the PET. And that error doesn't exist on the C64. Bad data. Bad. Maybe the most intimidating section and the whole thing for me back then was this section that shows every opcode, every mnemonic for 6510, spread over two pages here, and shows all the different operating, uh, all the different addressing modes, immediate, absolute, zero page, etc. And what each opcode does, number of cycles, and it's all in there. So this is extremely good but that i think when i was a kid i was just like what is this and it shows what the different flags do and all these little disclaimers i love this bit here note commodore semiconductor group cannot assume liability for the use of undefined opcodes <laughs> what an ominous thing the thing is that if if actual damage could happen or something really bad like this could totally happen by accident just by you typing random sys commands in at basic you would trigger accidentally some undefined opcodes so <laughs> could you imagine if the computer actually self exploded or something if uh you know if it damaged it, if it was like a killer poke the killer sys here on page 436 appendix n we're getting deeper into the vic chip specifications there's quite a bit of information here. It's mostly repeated from earlier in the book, but presented in a different way. And this is the section that just, I don't know, just I found bizarre as a kid. In the earlier part of the book and the user's guide that I had before this, they, the sprites, well, they were called sprites. But in this section of the book, 
it's there's a movable object block and I don't believe the word sprite is used at all here because that wasn't part of the specification so it took me a while to figure out that these movable object blocks really are the same thing as sprites and that's the first time I'd ever heard this term mob although later when I got an Amiga I believe they called them bobs on that blitter object blocks or something so the terminology seemed a bit more familiar by then <laughs> On page 343, there's a section on the game ports. Now this was huge to me as a kid, and I see I've got my notes here as I was figuring out when you peek. I don't think I fully understood that there are just five bits here and how you should use AND to mask out the upper three bits. So you just get these uh, values from 0 to 31, and they're actually inverted where you get a one. I was talking about this a uh, little in my, in that recent Sprite joystick episode. And I, I do have a sequel plan, like a second episode follow-up. Learning how to program for the joystick when I went and bought a joystick, which was the Slick Stick, uh, the little brother to the famous Tac 2. Once I could get a Sprite on the screen with another section of the book and then put that together with the information here about reading the joystick, there's this chart here in this little program. That was amazing. And I still find today when I'm teaching kids how to do game development, uh, sometimes on the 64, a couple times, or also in the MIT language called Scratch, then that is the first thing I try to get a kid to do, is whether it's with a joystick or with the arrow keys, if it's on Scratch on a PC or Mac, and get a sprite moving around the screen under joystick control. Because what is more motivating than that? That you've got that core element of a video game going on. So that got a lot of reading there. And then the scary assembly language version of it. And there's a paddle section here on the next page. And actually I was just looking at this. I've got another episode planned about how to read the, um, well, anyway, it's, it's fulfilling a childhood, uh, goal and it involved writing the paddle. I'm going to save that. That's an upcoming episode as well. This is a section I still use very frequently. It's all the screen codes shown both uh, character set one and two that you get by holding down the shift and the commander keys, as it says here. And this is when you poke to the screen. These are all the values that you can poke in. Uh, that 81 is the one I was always using in my games because uh, it's just this round ball figure. <laughs> also, that Q, when that's reversed, it's a reversed ball. You get that when you're doing a cursor down on the uh, in a print statement. But yeah, thoughts. It's good times here. And these ASCII and character codes. And it always seemed bizarre to me that there were all these empty values and then the colors were just wedged in here, there, and everywhere. White, red, blue, green. I feel like somebody kind of decoded some of the logic to this. Uh, I'm trying to remember where I read that. And of course, the famous uh, Petsky characters. All that excellent Petsky art that people are still doing today using this character set. All right, my camera just cut out. <laughs> so, got it going again here. But if anything sounds or looks different, that's why. Just a little bit more here. This table of music note values is interesting. These are actually incorrect numbers. There's a relationship between the clock speed of the C64, or of that dot clock, and how it's fed into the SID, because those are all driven by the same clock. So when your clock speed is different on NTSC versus PAL, that actually affects the SID as well. So the pitch of the sound coming out of the SID on an NTSC versus a PAL C64 is a bit different because of that different clock speed. So that's why these table values are actually incorrect on PAL. Now, of course, a lot of people wouldn't notice that, but if you are sensitive to pitch, perfect pitch like my daughter has, then you would notice if these are significantly flat or sharp, or certainly if you tried to play them with another instrument. This bibliography is a funny little chapter that's referring to a whole bunch of interesting PET and VIC-20 books. 
And this is where they do a little promotion for their own magazine, Commodore and PowerPlay. Commodore actually had its own magazine for a while. Commodore, the microcomputer magazine, was the more serious of the two. And PowerPlay was aimed more at the home and game market. I've got some copies of that early magazine, but they discontinued it fairly early when the uh, third-party magazines, like the Run magazine, uh, My Favorite Transactor, Ahoy, and uh, Computes Gazette all came along, and Commodore didn't find that uh, profitable anymore, for whatever reason. These functions here, deriving mathematical functions, and it shows how to get all these different things, secant, cosecant, and crazy ones like inverse hyperbolic cosecant. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, amazing equivalencies to get this function out of the existing functions in the Commodore 64 Basic. And I had no idea, I remember being a kid, my aunt, my parents had no idea about what I was doing with my computer, but my aunt had a master's degree in math and then ended up getting hired by the computer department at our local university. So she was the only one in the family who could understand some of these. So. I go, Auntie, what's uh, inverse cotangent? I was 11 or 12 years old, and I'm asking her these questions, and she's doing her best to explain it to me. <laughs> so another interesting fact, the dynamic RAM refresh. One of the advantages of the, well, one of the reasons the C64 could be so cheap was that it used DRAM, dynamic RAM, instead of S, static RAM. And that was possible because the VIC chip, the 65, 66, six, well, 67, the VIC chip has additional circuitry and it can refresh uh, five 8 bit row addresses every raster line. So while the VIC is generating the video display, it's also going off and reading and writing RAM and refreshing it because dynamic RAM needs to be. Uh, read, like recharged, for it to hold its value. And if that doesn't happen often enough, it will actually lose its value. And like static RAM, which keeps its value, that's a fact. I, I'm not sure everybody knows about that. I think that's about it. Um, of course, there's a huge section on BASIC here, going through all the different keywords. But it's not as thorough for certain things like disk operations as I would have liked. The section on programming graphics really is excellent. We looked at the character set. Well, of course, the sprites. I, I need to... Oh, there it is. Look, it opened right to it. And the famous Commodore balloon. That was amazing. Not only to see that balloon fly across the screen and the little routine to read it, but that you could use this as your own sprite editor and just go and draw these those there's that ball at 81 oh yeah right here if the string equals the ball character so this was an excellent little sprite editor that they gave you and you could get um you know you could change that sprite very easily there within the data statements that really isn't the most efficient way of doing this but you know when you didn't know any better this was an excellent start. Oh, I had just a couple other things. This memory management on the Commodore 64. This is an okay article. Certainly a lot better than nothing. But this is about how you can switch RAM and ROM out. This was absolutely bewildering to me as a kid. Especially if you tried to play with this, you would crash basic. This gives you an idea of all the different configurations that the Commodore 64 can be in. But... It wasn't clear to me that a bunch of these signals actually come off of the cartridge port, so they're not available to the programmer. It's interesting how many different ways the Commodore can be configured. I remember some some people, it was kind of scandalous that the Commodore 64 is supposed to have 64K, and yet when you turned it on, it only had 38K. What's up with that? I think people who owned other computers would make fun of that. But the fact is, all 64K was available to the machine language programmer, and some of the later C64 games absolutely used all that RAM. It's just, it was a complex map, and people just didn't understand that. And here's the version with all 64K RAM exposed, but normally you would have input-output overlaid, uh, the kernel ROM, basic ROM, 
this is the normal configuration right here. Oh, that's that's what the wrong. That's not the normal one. Yeah, there's the default basic configuration. But it's interesting to see how many different ways you can configure the C64. Very powerful for the time. A section on kernel. Here's about how when there's an auto start ROM cartridge. I was just playing around with this. I've got a, a Easter egg that I'm going that I think I first person discover. I was going to go through its uh, game cartridge, and um, I'm going to be explaining that in an episode coming up soon. I've actually done pre-production on, I don't know, four or five, six episodes, and I, I just need to get recording them, editing them, and getting them out to you. Oh, and this uh, the section about the kernel, all the calls that you can make to the operating system here, most interesting one to me as a kid was plot because that would allow you to move the cursor to a specific x and y position uh very useful for game programming oh and uh the famous ffd2 where is that to print a character yeah there it is character out and more detail sorry about the stains here i don't know this this book went through a lot that may even be the yop <laughs> jeff spilled There's my my beat up copy, and here's that shiny one from from Debbie uh, to Wayne. Wayne wasn't as rough on his book as I was. Okay, thanks for watching. I hope you're happy with this kind of episode. Uh, if this isn't what you had in mind, please let me know what you would like to see for these exclusive videos. I think it's it'd be best if the exclusive episodes I make are more niche, uh, more nerdy, arguably more boring. I'm not going to deliberately make a boring episode. What am I trying to say? An episode that has less mainstream appeal? Like, I'm not going to make uh, patron-only Easter egg videos since those seem to be so popular on my channel. Instead, something focused on programming or my own memories of something. So if you have ideas of what you'd like to see me do, please post them. and It's very likely I will try to do that for you. I will for sure do at least one episode a month. And of course, I have to keep making the videos for the main channel. Okay, I really appreciate your support. Thank you, and we'll talk to you next time. Never be bored, never